good morning everybody uh, thank you very much people from GBank for the invitation uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, it's a good opportunity to talk about some of our results uh, so of some research that we are uh, conducting at Embrapa, amazing sorbo and uh, I'm very happy to be back in the Tizal. Uh, to see a lot of friends, so many friends, so many nice people. So thank you very much. <laughs> so the, the title of my presentation is uh, Genomic Prediction for Abiotic Stress Tolerance in Maize and Sorghum. And uh, I uh, split my presentation in two uh, different parts. Uh, Genomic Prediction for Drought Tolerance in Maize and genomic predictions for phosphor use efficiency in soil. Uh, genomic predictions for drought tolerance uh, in maize, uh, in this project we are, uh, we have already published some, some results, but in sorghum we are just starting, so we don't have so many results, but uh, I, I will show for you some ideas uh, about the, the, the research of phosphorus that we are conducting at Embrapa. Uh, so, uh, in the first part uh, of my presentation, I, I will talk about drought tolerance. So, it's important to highlight the importance of maize crop in Brazil. Um, uh, so, Brazil is the third largest producer of uh, maize and the second largest exporter of maize. Uh, the maize in Brazil is uh, commonly cropped in two different seasons. Uh, safra, uh, which is the, the first season, that's uh, cultivated from August to March. And the second season, that's called safrinha, that's cultivated from February to June. Uh, in the last 30 years, uh, in this graph, and in this plot, we can see this uh, green line that it, uh, corresponds to the second season, and the red line that corresponds to the first season, and this blue line is the, the total maize production in Brazil. So in the, the last 30 years, uh, there was an, an, an increase, an average increase of 12% uh, per year uh, in the second season maize production, the, the green line. So nowadays, it is the most important season uh, of maize in Brazil. Uh, in the 2016-2017 harvest, the second season corresponded to almost 7% of the total maize production, uh, which was uh, around 68 uh, million tons uh, of maize in the second season, out of 90, almost 98 million tons of uh, maize, the total production of maize in, in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, maize is mainly cultivated in the, the center-south region, uh, which is the major uh, producing region of maize in Brazil. Uh, I highlighted here in this, in this, in this plot the uh, Mato Grosso, State, Mato Grosso do Sul, Goiás, Minas Gerais, São Paulo e Paraná. And Paraná. That, uh, these are the states, uh, the most producer uh, states uh, in Brazil. So, uh, this region accounts for almost 50% of the total maize production of Brazil. Um, however, the, the uh, maize production in this Brazilian region is mainly concentrated in the second season, after harvesting the soybeans in the, the first season. So, in this season, we have strong variations in rainfall. And these strong variations in rainfall can cause water limitations that can reduce drastically the maize production uh, in this season uh, in Brazil. So uh, actually, uh, the, 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 the main challenge faced by plant breeders today uh, is uh, to develop uh, drought tolerant maize hybrids. Uh, so here I, I, I'm showing the uh, cumulative rainfall in the last 15 days of April uh, in the, in the center-south region of Brazil. Uh, in this uh, period, uh, we have the pre-flowering uh, of maize cultivated in this region. So it's a very critical 
uh, stage of development that it's uh, the, 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 the drought tolerance has uh, a lot of uh, negative impact in the production. <coughs> uh, uh, in maize breeding for drought tolerance, uh, the experiments are performed in uh, well watered and water stressed conditions. And in several years and several locations. So, uh, a phenotype screening for several traits is often, often laborious and time consuming. Uh, drought stress, uh, the, the, the main effect of drought stress in maize is to increase the antithesis silk interval uh, due, due to a delay in silking, which results in severe uh, weed losses uh, in maize. Oh, here I, I'm showing uh, a drought tolerant lining of maize and a drought sensitive lining of the, the breeding program at Embrapa. Um, uh, there are different uh, uh, selection strategies that are commonly used in plant breeding and uh, <coughs> traditional uh, phenotypic selection, the, the, the visual selection of the best pl uh, plants, uh, the more tolerant plants, and also the, the pedigree assisted selection. Uh, but in this strategy, uh, it's necessary to have a, a, a well, uh, a well, uh, a good knowledge about the genealogy of several generations of crossing and advancing lines. And uh, sometimes, as highlighted by Jeff, uh, we don't have uh, some information about these parents. Uh, so we have some missing information or we can have some errors in the pedigree. So uh, we cannot, uh, these informations are not so reliable uh, to perform some predictions. And <laughs> uh, so in this case, the genetic relationships are calculated based on genealogy, so the kinship coefficients. Uh, so the, the expected uh, degrees of genetic sim similarity in this case, because of the, the, the missing uh, information and the errors, uh, they are not equal to the realized degrees of genetic similarity. So, um, <coughs> another uh, thing that it, it's not accounted by the pedigree uh, information is that we have Mendelian segregation. So, uh, even full sip individuals, they can have different alleles for the same loci. And this is not accounted for the, 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 the pedigree method. <coughs> so, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, we are using uh, genomic selection is widely used for uh, predict the performance of uh, new individuals uh, that were not evaluated in any environment. Uh, so we, one of the, the most used methods, uh, statistical methods for genomic selection is the genomic best linear unbiased prediction, the GPLOP. Uh, which is a marker-based method to predict the genetic responses of in the untested individuals using all available high-density SNP markers to estimate the realized genetic similarities between individuals. Um, compared to other uh, available statistical methods that are widely applied to genome selection, this is a, a less computationally intensive compared to, to that method. And uh, through this method, we can uh, achieve accurate predictions for untested individuals. Uh, and we, we, we can reduce the number of field-tested individuals, field-tested genotypes. Uh, the benefits of genomic selection are more evident when traits are difficult, time-consuming, or, or expensive to measure, or when uh, we are evaluating several environments, and uh, <coughs> so it's a, a very complicated task when we don't have enough resources, uh, genetic resources and uh, financial resources. Uh, 
there are many strategies of using genome selection in a, be in a breeding program. At Embrapa, we are mainly using genome selection to predict single cross hybrids. Uh, for example, here I, I include a scan to explain a little bit uh, about the, the, the technique that we are uh, using. So, uh, for example, we have a training population that is a, a, a panel of single cross hybrids, for example. Uh, this uh, phenotypic data is from the historic data of a breeding program, for example, of uh, our maize breeding program. So, uh, we have uh, um, at least uh, six years of uh, evaluations in the late stage of breeding program. Uh, so, we have uh, uh, different locations and uh, different years, different conditions, for example, uh, different drought stress conditions, different um, phosphorus efficiency conditions, uh, phosphorus uh, availability conditions. <laughs> uh, and we also have the genotypic data for the, the parental lines uh, of the hybrids. So, uh, combining both information, we can include this uh, in a genome prediction model that could be a GBLOP considering only additive effects or additive plus dominance effects. And uh, uh, before, uh, based on this training population, that it's the single cross hybrids, and uh, based on the genotype of their parents, we can infer the genotype of the hybrids and include this. Uh, uh, as a, a, a genetic, genomic relationship matrix in the GBLOP models. And these models, we can apply a procedure, uh, the cross-validation procedure, uh, to validate the, the, the prediction uh, ability of these models. <coughs> uh, in this uh, cross-validation proce procedure, we can use, for example, the uh, K-fold uh, validation procedure, in which we can uh, split the uh, training population in trainings, in a training set and in a testing set. And in the training set, we consider all the phenotype information and the genotype information of the hybrids. And in the testing set, uh, we omit the information about the phenotypic uh, information of the hybrids. So uh, we can repeat this uh, validation process and to estimate the accuracy of predicting uh, new hybrids uh, based on the phenotypic information of other related hybrids. So we need some uh, degree of relationship between testing and uh, training uh, set populations. Uh, after uh, validating, uh, the GBLOP models, uh, we can use these models uh, to predict new uh, selection candidates. For example, new single cross, cross hybrids that uh, were not evaluated, were not phenotyped uh, for drug tolerance or other, other traits that we are working on. So uh, for, uh, for drug tolerance in Maisie, we have uh, usually multi-environment trials because the, the experiments are performed in different water conditions, well watered and water stressed, and across different years and locations. And in Maisie, uh, heterosis is widely explored to generate new cultivars and is usually attributed to no additive genetic effects, in particular to dominance effects. So we should also include uh, in the GBLOP models the dominance uh, deviations. Uh, so uh, to uh, uh, predict the performance of untested maize hybrid, it's important to consider a genetic statistical model that simultaneously account for multi-environment trials data as well as for active and dominance effects. Uh, if we account for genotype by environment interaction effects, uh, we can explore the information across environments, which may improve the predict predictive power of uh, genomic selection models, like uh, Jeff already said in his presentation. 
É, é, dominance effects in the genomic selection models are important uh, for a realistic and more accurate partitioning of the genetic variance. <coughs> but uh, of course, it depends on the, the, the design of the, the, the population, the mating design, and the, 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 the number of individuals in this population. And uh, most part of the, the results that I'm going to show here uh, are from the, the the paper of Caio Diaz. Caio was a PhD student at Embrapa. Uh, he was working on genomic selection for drought tolerance using additive and dominance effects and integrating G by E in these uh, genomic prediction models. And he was a, a he is a, a, an outstanding person, an outstanding professional. And now he is, he has a postdoc position at Augustus Lab. <laughs> and nowadays he is in a postdoc uh, with Hans Peter Pifo in the Netherlands, and he is also working with us in a, in a collaborative research with Augusto Pifo and Embrapa. Uh, he he is working with a very huge, uh, brilliant program data set from Maisy, and he is doing a lot of uh, analysis, exploring genotype by environment interaction and using this uh, historical, historical data. So uh, the, the, the goals of this work was to evaluate the accuracy of genomic selection to predict the performance of untested maze single cross hybrids for five traits under two different water conditions, well watered and water stressed, uh, using high density SNP markers, panels, and multi-environment trials analysis. Uh, the second uh, goal was to compare the predictive accuracy achieved by models that account only for additive effects, uh, called model A, uh, against models with additive plus dominance effects, the AD models, uh, and also to explore the stability of hybrids via latent regression plots using AD models. So uh, the phenotype data used in this study uh, was collected for a set of 308 single cross maze hybrids. These hybrids were generated uh, based on single crosses between uh, 188 inbred lines and two testers. Uh, L3, that is a flint tester, and L2283, that is a dent tester. So uh, not all inbred lines were crossed with both both testers, because we have at Embrapa three uh, common heterotic groups. Uh, the dent group, flint, and another group that we call C, that is a, a, a set of inbred lines that combines well with both dent and flint, flint heterotic groups. Uh, field experiments were uh, performed in waters, well watered and water stressed conditions in two locations in two years. The locations, uh, one of the locations is a, uh, the experimental station of Embrapa Maze Sorgo, uh, located in the state of Minas Gerais, and the other location is in uh, Embrapa Mid North, that is located in the northeast of Brazil. <coughs> so uh, the, evaluated, the traits evaluated were grain yield, years per plot, Female and male flowering time and untested silk interval, as that it's uh, very common in drought tolerance papers, in drought tolerance studies. Uh, the field, ooh, it's difficult to see, but uh, this is the field layout of one uh, trial. So uh, the design used in these uh, experiments were a group of six experiments. So they, the 308 hybrids were split in six, six different sets. So each one is a trial. And each trial was arranged as a complete randomized, uh, a randomized complete block design. And uh, four checks were included in each trial, and uh, we had three replicates per trial. So we, uh, the trials one, two, and three uh, represent the, the uh, were included the the inbred line is crossed with L3, the flint tester, and uh, the trials four, five, and six uh, include the, the inbred line crossed with the, the dent tester. 
<coughs> the 188 inbred lines were genotyped uh, by sequencing, uh, generating after cleaning all the, the, the data uh, around the 47,000 uh, SNP markers. Uh, we uh, filtered for uh, minor allele frequency uh, up to 5% and uh, missing data up to 20% and also to a maximum of 5% uh, of uh, heterozygote. Um, so as I already said, the heterotic groups were then Flinty and C and the testers L3, L2283 Dente. And here I have a PCA uh, based on the genotype the, the, of the SNP markers. And we can see uh, two different groups here that uh, corresponds to the flint lines, the dent flying lines. You, and we can, have, uh, we can see some uh, black points here that correspond to the, the C lines. So uh, the genotypes of the hybrids uh, were obtained based on the SNP marker genotypes of their uh, inbred lines, that, uh, of their parents, the, the inbred lines and the testers. Uh, genome correlation shipping matrix were uh, calculated using the D software, the genome matrix, that uh, it's a software uh, developed by uh, the Salvador Gezan group. Uh, who is a, a professor in the University of Florida and Kai was there for a, a PhD sandwich program and uh, so we calculate the additive uh, genome relationship matrix using the, the method proposed by Young 2010 and uh, the dominance uh, relationship matrix was calculated based on the Vitica uh, method uh, of 2013 Okay, these are the these are the, the expressions to to calculate these matrices. I will don't uh, give more details. I think I have a lot of things to to say, so I I will skip this. <coughs> so uh, we perform G blob analysis in single environment and also in multi environment trial analysis. In the multi environment trial analysis, the eight these different trials were split in three groups, uh, four trials under that, uh, water, what, well water conditions and four trials under water stressed conditions. All in, and another group, the third one, uh, including all eight trials on both well water and water stressed conditions. So we performed three group of analysis. So uh, the generic mixed model that was considered uh, is this, uh, where uh, Y is a vector of uh, phenotypes in the different environments for the different, for one trait, because we performed the analysis for one trait uh, at a time. So me is the, the vector of uh, general means, uh, S is the effect of um, environment, B dot S is the effect of uh, set with environment, and R dot C is the, the effect of uh, replicates with set with environment. And here, Z1 and A dot S, this is the additive effect, and this is the dominance effect that were also included. Dominance with environment and additive effect with environment, and the error. <coughs> For the additive effect, we considered, uh, we assumed a multi-variate uh, normal distribution uh, with a vector of zero of means and a uh, various covariance matrix uh, as the, the chronicle product of the additive genomic relationship matrix and a factor analytic for the additive term. Uh, matrix, so uh, it's a factor uh, 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 analytic for the additive genetic effect uh, with environment. And the dominance effect, uh, which was also assumed as a multivariate normal distribution, and uh, with the vector of zero uh, means and uh, 
very covariance matrix that was uh, defined as the, the chronicle product of the dominance genome relationship matrix and the variance covariance genetic uh, uh, dominance effect across environments, the, the variance of the matrix of various covariance for the dominance genetic effect across environments. So, uh, and the, uh, for the residual uh, effect, we consider uh, for each environment a, a diagonal uh, uh, matrix, residual matrix, so in which we, we had uh, um, specific variances for each environment and no correlation between environments for the residual effects. So uh, the factor analytic uh, matrix uh, of order two uh, was considered uh, to model the uh, various covariance for the additive and dominance genetic effects with environments. Uh, why we uh, decided to work with FA models? Because they are more parsimonious models and approximate uh, to the unstructured matrix, but with a reduction in the number of parameters. And this is uh, particularly interesting when we are dealing with a, a, a large number of environments. So uh, in the... In the FI structure, uh, vertical covariance structure, we have, we assume heterogeneous variances uh, between environment and specific pairwise correlations between trials for the additive and for the dominance effects simultaneously uh, in the general prediction framework. So here I include some examples of uh, various covariance structures that we can consider. Uh, they, uh, for example, the fixed models uh, uh, commonly use the identity matrix in which we have a common variance component uh, for all environments and no correlation between environments. The diagonal matrix in which we have specific variance components for environments and uh, no correlation between environments. And here, the, the factor analytic matrix that we have uh, different various components uh, for environments and specific correlations for each pair of environments. Um, proper modeling of the genotype by environment interaction effects may improve the pre predictive power of genomic selection models. So this is very important when we are dealing with uh, general predictions in different environments. <coughs> For the uh, cross-validation uh, procedures, we consider two different scenarios uh, to evaluate this information of the different environments helping to predict uh, the genetic responses in a, a, a particular environment. So uh, CB1, uh, for example, is the traditional cross-validation scheme uh, in which new hybrids have not been phenotyped in any trial, in any environment, and uh, predictions, so uh, in this case, predictions of an untested hybrid do not borrow information from any trial for this particular hybrid. Uh, then uh, predictions of untested hybrids are based on phenotypic and genotypic information of other related hybrids that were evaluated uh, in almost all uh, different environments. And we also tested uh, uh, another cross-validation uh, scenario, the CV2, in which the hybrids were phenotyped in some trials, but not in others. And uh, in this case, the predictions of an untested hybrid borrow some information from other trials for this particular hybrid, in addition to the information of related hybrids. So uh, in this scenario, uh, there is an, ad an, an advantage of uh, borrowing information from correlated trials for a, a specific hybrid. <coughs> Uh, so we consider a, a, a five-fold uh, cross-validation procedure using a stratified sampling method, method to, um, uh, to include in both training validation sets uh, proportional all, proportionally all the genetic backgrounds that we uh, have in our uh, training population. Uh, because we have a single cross hybrids that were the crosses, the cross between dainty lines and flinty 
tester, flint and dent tester, and C crossed with both dent and flint tester. Cool. So, <coughs> uh, so the, the genotypic effects of the hybrids were uh, corresponds to the uh, additive genetic effect plus the dominance genetic effect. And the covariancy of the genotypic effect can be uh, derived as the, the covariancy for the additive effects and the covariance for the dominance effects. Uh, the predictive ability of the models were estimated as the correlation between observed uh, genotypic effects uh, and the genomic predicted genotypic effects uh, using the multi environment G blood model. And uh, the, the observed genotypic effects were uh, calculated, were obtained based on single environment trial analysis, considering hybrids as fixed effects. Uh, so this is the, the uh, result for the predictive ability between the models, uh, model A and model AD. Model A considers only the additive effects, and model AD considers additive plus dominance effects. In gray, uh, the gray bars corresponds to the cross-validation uh, scenario two, and the black bars to the cross-validation scenario one. So we can see uh, that in both models, the cross-validation scenario two uh, achieved the uh, higher uh, predictive abilities than uh, the cross-validation one <coughs> for almost all traits. Uh, here I, I have the, the conditions, the, the two first letters corresponds to the, the, the condition, the water condition, and uh, the other letters corresponds to the traits that were evaluated. So here in this table, I'm showing uh, the predi predictive ability that we uh, achieved using the, the g block models, multi environment g block models, and uh, we can see that we have a, a different uh, predictive abilities between uh, water conditions, well watered and water stressed. In orange is the water stressed conditions, and in blue is the well watered conditions. And the, the difference between the additive and additive plus dominance models were more evident in the water stressed conditions. For example, we can we can see here for grain yield that we can, we can see that the, the additive plus dominance models were uh, better than the, the additive models to predict the genetic response of single cross hybrids. And uh, for the other uh, secondary traits, we cannot see so many differences between the additive and the additive plus dominance models. So, uh, but for grain yield, uh, we can see that the active plus dominance model was uh, the best model to predict the genetic response of hybrids. Uh, another interesting thing that we used here uh, were latent regression models uh, based on the, the factor analytic VCOV matrix, uh, which allowed to estimate the environment to environment additive dominance and additive plus dominance genetic correlations. And uh, based on this uh, FA structure, we can uh, infer about the stability of genetic effects uh, using latent regression plots. Uh, it was firstly uh, initially proposed by Cullis uh, in 2014, but only for additive effects. Uh, so here in this uh, study, we extended uh, the latent regression plots for uh, to include also the dominance effects to study the stability of dominance effects across environments. Um, here is the, the the result of the latent regression uh, models, and here uh, we can see the hybrid 11. This is the background of this hybrid. And here are the, the additive and dominance effects, the estimated values for the additive and dominance effects. And here we have factor one, two, uh, uh, for the additive and for the dominance effects. Um, values close to zero for the factor one and two indicates that this effect, this genetic effect, uh, is more stable 
uh, across environments. <coughs> For example, this 11, this hybrid 11, uh, it's, it has more uh, additive uh, stable effects uh, across environments because the, the values are close to zero. And the, the hybrid 2010, uh, we have the opposite situation when we have a, where we have a, a dominance, a stable dominance effect across environment for the for this uh, hybrid. And here <laughs> it's the the, the regression, the latent uh, latent regression plot that we uh, it's a, a regression uh, of the predicted breeding value on the factor one and factor two for the additive effects. And I'm showing also the, the hybrids 11 and 2010. And here uh, are the, the regression plots of the uh, predicted uh, dominance deviation uh, against the uh, uh, first and second uh, factor of the, 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 factor anal the factor analytic models. Uh, so uh, that in that table I was showing the slope of the Latin regression plot, and here we can see that the uh, hybrid uh, 11, uh, the additive effects of these hybrids are more stable uh, across environments. The points correspond to the, the uh, predicted genetic. Uh, uh, to the this regression for different environments, okay, and uh, the 2010 hybrid, uh, we can see that uh, this hybrid has a, a more dominance uh, uh, dominance effect stability. So the conclusions, differences in predictive, predictive accuracy between A and AD models were more evident in uh, water stressed conditions than in well water conditions. Uh, small differences were observed between the predict predictive accuracies of A and AD models for the secondary traits, for example, years per plenty and ASI under water stressed conditions and ASI, EPP and female flowering time under water, well water conditions. Uh, the dominance effects uh, were more important for the genome predictions of grain yield, as we ex expected. And uh, these results uh, can give us some information about the genetic architecture of the drought, to drought tolerance traits. And can say that uh, the, the, the genetic architecture affects the prediction uh, accuracy of A and AD models. <coughs> So the, the, the predi predictive accuracies found in this study were similar or higher than the ones reported in other studies for uh, drought tolerance in maize. And thus, we conclude that the inclusion of dominance effect in the model can improve considerably prediction of untested hybrids for drought tolerance. Uh, in general, CV2 uh, were, uh, was a, 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 a better uh, strategy than CV1 because uh, it allowed to borrow information from trials in which the hybrids have already been phenotyped and pe predicting the genetic response of new hybrids is more challenging than predicting hybrids that have been already evaluated in other environments. Uh, latent regression plots are useful to infer about the stability of additive and dominance effects across environments for a given hybrid. And uh, also, the latent regression plots allow selecting among all high-performance hybrids those with a stable additive effect across environments. Then we can intermake their parents, uh, the inbred lines in the next breeding cycle, and op optimize the crosses to improve the hybrid's stability and the expected genetic gains. So. Uh, High performance test cross hybrids showing stable additive and dominance effects across environments can be directly indicated as a potential hybrid cultivar for a given uh, mega environment. High levels of predictive accuracy can be achieved for drought tolerance traits by including GBIE, additive and dominance genetic effects 
in the genome prediction framework uh, using realized genomic relationship matrix estimated through genome-wide SNP markers. And uh, this multi-environment trial GBLOP AD model, uh, it's an interesting approach to increase the selection efficiency, to optimize process, and to accelerate the genetic gains for drought tolerance in maize breeding programs. And it can be easily extended to accommodate environmental variables and use it to predict and test the hybrids in new, hybrids, in new environments. Um, how many time do I have? Five? Okay. So uh, the, the last part of my presentation, uh, I will talk a little bit about phosphor use efficiency in sorghum. And uh, we are uh, starting this project. And uh, another problem in, in tropical soils is the, the low P availability. And, uh, and uh, sorghum is a staple food crop for the West African savannah zones. The Guinea sorghum, that is a, a race of sorghum, is broadly adapted to different stresses, including those uh, caused by poor soil fertility. Uh, low P soils, uh, low phosphor soils, limit sorghum expansion through agri agricultural frontiers in which food production needs continuous improvement, such as in Africa. Uh, so, uh, bre sorghum breeding programs are working for adaptation to low P conditions uh, for global uh, food security. So, uh, here in this uh, project, we are working with a multi uh, parental population uh, that is now in a S2 phase. And this multi parent population. Uh, was uh, obtained based on multiple crosses between this uh, male ster sterile uh, population with 24 restored lines. And this population uh, was uh, submitted to some cycles of recombination and phenotype and selection for aluminum tolerance and phosphorus, uh, only aluminum tolerance in greenhouse and uh, were again uh, recombine it and uh, self-fertilize it and uh, the S1 populations were genotyped for gene specific SNP markers that it's this SB mate and the SB pistol one. SB mate is a well-known gene uh, of sorghum uh, to that confer tolerance to aluminum and SP pistol one is uh, another, uh, we have some homologous in, to the OS pistol one uh, of sorghum. That is the, this one is the uh, sorghum starvation, uh, phosphorus starvation uh, tolerance. And so uh, this population is now in uh, S2. And it was, again, genotyped for these uh, gene-specific markers and also uh, using GBS. Uh, this is a collaborative research with a colleague uh, from Embrapa Amazing Sorghum, Jurandir Magalhães. I, I think he, many of you know uh, him. And uh, so this population has approximately 200 individuals and uh, was phenotyped in the field. Hydropo hydroponics conditions for root morphology traits and also for uh, P use efficient efficiency uh, related traits. And uh, this is the PhD student that is working in this uh, project. So the next step of her project is to uh, fit uh, different genome predictions model models for several field and hydroponic traits related to P use efficiency and root morphology in low P conditions. We are going to consider in mold trait uh, models and uh, different uh, statistical uh, methods uh, to predict this. And uh, we are also uh, trying to incorporate the gene specific SNP markers to predict the genetic breeding values. For example, the SB mate uh, specific markers and the pistol one uh, specific markers. So uh, thank you very much. That's it. And uh, here uh, it's our team uh, at Embrapa that we have uh, maize breeders, sorghum breeders, uh, molecular biologists, and PhD students. And we have a, a, a very strong collaboration with Augusto 
uh, Garcia here, and Caio Olimpio is also working uh, in, in our project uh, with Maisie. And part of the Maisie work that I present here was in collaboration, collaboration with Dr. Uh, Salvador Gazan of the University of Fla Florida, and we received the financial support of Embrapa, CAPES, uh, CNPq, and FAPIMIC. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Marta, for your talk. We have time for some questions. Thanks for a great presentation. I like the, <clears throat> the story with Mays. Um, I had not seen the latent regression idea before, which I'm interested in trying myself. But when we think about, say, Finlay-Wilkinson regression, which is this is clearly kind of a, a newer version of that older idea, uh, we can think about two different kinds of stability. The static stability, which is a slope of zero, as you say, but often we actually prefer things that have a dynamic stability with a slope um, closer to one, uh, so that they are responsive genotypes. Is there a similar uh, nuance to stability? Because you were focusing more on this, the idea that things would have a slope of zero, but what do we know about these latent factors and do you want genotypes that seem to respond as the latent factor goes to higher values? Uh, I don't know if, if I understand well your question, but uh, we are look, looking for uh, two different kinds of genotypes, for example, hybrid with the active effects for uh, stable active effects are interesting for selecting their, their parents, intercrossing and generating the new inbred lines with stable active effects. And uh, the dominancy, uh, hybrids with domi stable dominance effects are also important because uh, they can be uh, released as new cultivars. Uh, so uh, we have a uh, interest in, the, in both additive effect, stable additive effect, and stable dominance effect. Uh, it was that. That's not. That's not what I was asking. But we we can talk more afterwards about it. Sure. Yeah. What is in Portuguese? Pode, claro. É, Por que não foi usada no modelo a epistasia? se uh, os autores consideram que ela não existe ou porque é difícil de ser detectada? Sim, que é Podia, difícil. Podia uh, é. traduzir por inglês, por favor? Ah, ok. Uh, he is asking uh, why we don't uh, use the epistasis, uh, don't include the epistasis in these models. Uh, because uh, we tried to, to include the epistasis in this model, but uh, we didn't have the... Uh, higher predictive abilities than the ones uh, that we achieved with the additive and dominance effects. So uh, we think that it's because of the, 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 the mating design of the population, the constitution of the population, that it's not ideal for uh, dealing with epistasis. So uh, we have another uh, data set that we are going to try to fit uh, this kind of models. Congratulations on your presentation. So you mentioned you used lines from the later states of a breeding program. Do you believe you can have any bias or decrease in accuracy if you try to predict the lines in early states of the breeding program? Um, yes, uh, we can have because the, the uh, genotypes of the, the in bad lines in the initial stages, they are not so homozygous than in the, the late stage. And uh, But I think it's better to use the phenotypic information of the late stage uh, trials to predict the initial trials than the, the opposite situation. Because we have more replications, more uh, environments. So uh, I think the, the the data is more uh, has more information than uh, predicting the initial stage. But what about if you think um, 
on the, the that some alleles were le already fixed or were under selection. Do you believe you can have some genetic bias, something like that? Yes, I, I think so. Thank you. I enjoy it. Uh, in the final of the, the presentation, you said that the most uh, is more challenging to predict the performance of a hybrid, not uh, evaluating the field yet. Yeah. So, what your strategy? So, you, what strategy you suggest for to use that those information to, to in, in hybrid in, in hybrid breeding pro programs? Yes, uh, we are starting to work with this. We are thinking about using uh, covert covert uh, environment covariates and include these covariates in the, the prediction models to help to predict the. Uh, uh, the genetic responses of new hybrids that were evaluated in some environment, but not in, not in, in all environments. Uh, we are trying to use this especially to predict some uh, hybrids that were in the intermediate stage of the breeding program and to predict these hybrids that were evaluated in uh, less environments than the hybrids in the late stage. So we are trying to use these hybrids that didn't were evaluated in the late stage and to predict their performance in this late stage uh, phase of the, 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 the breeding program. Okay. Anyone else? So, I'd like to thank Mary Marta again to accept your invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation, it was a pleasure. <laughs>